Yee. Hair flip. Yeah, I'm a better bitch. I don't like it. Hair flip. Yeah. Oh my god. So you guys should be happy. Oh my goodness. Hair flip. But anyways, hair flip. And hair flipping on these toes. Hi. flashback the life and tragic death of former disney star bobby driscoll paperback mysteries usually end this way not disney fairy tales in march of 1968 a pair of children playing in an abandoned greenwich village in new york city discovered a man dead on a cot surrounded by beer bottles and religious handouts there were no obvious signs of foul play he had no identification the body was unknown and went unclaimed after failing to relocate the next of kin, authorities declared the man dead from hardening of arteries, a common side effect of longtime heroin use, and buried him in a mass unmarked grave on Bronx Hearts Island alongside other unidentified bodies and indignant souls who had fallen on hard times. And somewhere, although nobody is exactly sure where, on that island that once housed a woman's psychiatric asylum, a men's prison and patients quarantined during the outbreak of yellow fever in the 1870s is the final resting place of Peter Pan. It's also the final resting place of Bobby Driscoll, who became a household name at the age of nine with a starring role in Disney's controversial Song of the South. He won an Oscar at 12 and then at 16, went on to voice the title role in Disney's classic animated film about a boy who never wants to grow up. In this case, that boy's twisted world to manhood ultimately detoured into and out of jail throughout multiple marriages and divorces to the same woman and finally winding through Andy Warhol's factory to a tragic end. Even if the main character was the star in one of the most beloved Disney movies of all time. But such is the story of Bobby Driscoll, Household name at the age of 9, Oscar winner at age 12, the voice of Disney's animated Peter Pan at age 16, dead at the age of just 31. Keep watching to learn more about this classic Hollywood rise and fall, which reached its dramatic conclusion in March of 1968 when children playing in an abandoned, burned-out New York City apartment discovered a young man lying dead surrounded by empty bottles. The questions about his death began right at the crime scene. There were no signs of foul play. The man was unknown and had no identification. And as time went on, the body went unclaimed. Who was this man and what happened? This is the sad story of Bobby Driscoll. Bobby Driscoll's journey from child star to troubled adult included a stint in jail, multiple marriages and divorces to the same woman, inclusion into the wild world of Andy Warhol's factory scene, and ultimately a tragic end. When it came time to declare Bobby Driscoll's cause of death, authorities mentioned hardening of the arteries, a common side effect of habitual heroin use. They buried him in a mass, unmarked pauper's grave on Hart Island in the Bronx, New York. Along I 
think we better get the show going. Right. So you go over and call the magic mayor and get him to tell some stories. Walk the cushion, grab a chair. The Song of the South was a bigger movie that Disney did, actually won an Oscar for the movie. Um, Uncle Rufus is the one who played the role and sang the songs and voiced some of the characters in the movie, which is a very prejudiced movie, more so of racist. The tone of it, how it depicts black people right after slavery, uh, pretty much to make us seem very dumb. It dumbed us down to make us seem like we're very uneducated and things in that nature. And Remus even won a Oscar for this movie as well. And due to segregation at the time, he was not allowed to show up because the hotels around where the Oscars were, were, were still in segregation. So he wasn't allowed to be there basically because he was a black man. Although this black man had won an Oscar for Disney. Now, seeing these clips that we've seen before, I get that they're pretty offensive. Um, Uncle Remus is making himself pretty much look very dumb and, you know, more of like a, a, a yes, a massa, you know, type of person. But let's get into what really upset people. The clips in this movie that really pissed black people off. I'm by, he spied that tall baby. Then he sing out, how do you do? Brer Rabbit wait for the tall baby to say, fine, how are you? But the tall baby, he don't say nothing. And Brer Fox, he lay low. So, Brer Rabbit tried again. How do you do? But the tall baby ain't say nothing. Then Brer Rabbit scratch one ear with his off behind foot and loud, he gonna find out why he can't get no answer. Then he say, says he, What's the matter with you? I said, howdy. Is you all here? I said, howdy. But the tall baby, he don't say nothing. And Bill Fox, he lay low. Oh, I hope you hear him. <laughs> I hope it works. I sure would do <laughs> Bill Rabbit, loud, it's up to him to teach the stuck-up stranger some manners. And he said, look, if you don't say howdy time I count three, I'm going to bust you wide open. But the tall baby, he don't say nothing. And Bill Fox, he Bruh. lay low. Be quiet. So Bear Rabbit, he started counting. One. But the tall baby didn't say nothing. Bear Fox lay low and chuckling his stomach. <laughs> Two. But still the tall baby don't say nothing. Bear Fox, he lay low with the fidgets. Two and a half. <laughs> Three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bear Rabbit, he push and he pull and he heave and he haul. He kick and he squeal and he blow and he blow. But the more he flash around, the worse off he get. Till he's so stuck up he can scarcely move his eyeballs. I mean, as many times as they say tar baby, it's probably as many times as a person says like in a day. It's pretty insane how... You know, Tar Baby this and Tar Baby that and, and the Tar Baby didn't say anything. And the Tar Baby, Tar is a very offensive word towards black people, especially Tar Baby. I mean, can it get more race? Welcome back. I'm Rick Sanchez filling in for Paula Zahn. Out in the open, possible plans to bring a controversial Disney classic out of the studio vaults of Disney. I, I'm, I'm talking about the film song of the south uh, disney is now considering reissuing this movie on video and on dvd now critics say the problem is that this movie is blatantly racist blatantly offensive to african americans yet a growing number of people believe that it's about time that the movie is in fact re-released interesting argument here's entertainment correspondent brooke anderson with this one Disney's 1946 movie, Song of the South, has been locked in the company's vaults for decades. Never released for home viewing in the United States, even though it won an Oscar for its song, Zippity Doo Dah, and inspired the Splash Mountain rides at Disney's theme parks. For years, the film has been blasted as racist for the way it depicts Southern blacks. 
The primary character, Uncle Remus, is seen as a servile, happy-go-lucky simpleton bubbling over with ain't nobodies, ain't nevers, and you tells thems. A stereotype that, for many, dangerously glamorizes the harsh reality of post-slavery America. They ain't no place that nevers, and you tells thems. A stereotype that, for many, dangerously glamorizes the harsh reality of post-slavery America. They ain't no place that for. That film is racially demeaning, it's insulting, and it's offensive. It's a painful reminder of our past, where blacks were depicted as buffoons. That's a mess, I know it's that. Civil rights advocate Najee Ali is glad the film has been locked up all these years and wants it to stay that way. The Disney Corporation is going to find out very soon if they do release this film that African Americans will be outside protesting, that bringing back up that painful reminder is a slap in the face to our ancestors. That we would look at it again. Niger Ennis from the Congress on Racial Equality is well aware of the film's rocky history with blacks. James Baskett who was the first live black actor hired by Disney uh, to do this, could not go to the premiere of this film in Atlanta because he could not get a hotel room that would sleep him for the night because of segregation. However, unlike Ali, Ennis believes Disney has been wrong to block the movie. He does want the studio to release the film as long as it's accompanied by special features to educate. The Disney animators' strike of 1941 reflected anger at inequalities of pay and privileges at the non-unionized Walt Disney Productions. He even went so far as to contact the FBI to ask about alleged communist infiltration of his studios. Maybe that was what was causing the strike and not the inequalities in pay. When his studio's cartoonist tried to form a union, Disney bought an armed guards. He fired the organizers of the strike, cut everyone's wages, and slashed the hours of the studio coffee shop. At one point, Disney got so angry, he had to be physically restrained from attacking picketers. As a famously autocratic employer, Walt Disney responded to the five-week strike by firing many of his animators. The strike left the studio with only 694 employees. Many of Disney's top animators took their talents to rival animation studios such as Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, Screen Gems, and Warner Brothers. Allegations of the R-Word the portrayal of stereotypical characters like Uncle Remus in Disney's 1946 film Song of the South, Are the Crows in Dumbo, have caused many over the years to allege that these depictions of minority characters must echo Disney's real-life feelings. In fact, Song of the South is now deemed so offensive the Disney company won't even allow it to be seen in public. Then there are the accusations that have been made against Disney himself. In the biography, Walt Disney, Triumph of the American Imagination, author Neil Gabler said that during a meeting involving the film Snow White, Walt called the dwarves piles of the N-word, and in another, he used the term, well, another word that I can't use on YouTube. Disney also knew that Song of the South would be controversial and attempted to make it less so with a rewrite and a meeting with the NAACP. The meeting never happened, though, and Disney went ahead and released the film as is. But, to his credit, he later campaigned successfully for an honorary Academy Award for its star, James Baskett, the first black actor to be so honored. But Disney also faced controversy because of his refusal to hire minorities at Disneyland. 
It is important to note, however, that even if he did hold prejudicial feelings toward minorities, his views must have progressed at least a tiny bit as he hired his studio's first African-American animator in the late 1950s. If he had had some biased thinking, it came at least half an inch forward in his lifetime. Throughout the years since World War II, many have questioned Disney's uh, political loyalties exactly where they lied during the conflict. Many have even accused him of being a NAZI sympathizer who allegedly attended many meetings of the American NAZI party, though no one has ever been able to confirm that. Let me say that twice. Never been able to confirm that. Allegations that Walt Disney was anti-SEMITI the most obvious evidence for this ac accusation is the famous scene from The Three Little Pigs where the wolf was betrayed by a Jewish peddler. The scene was later reanimated. Then there's the fact that in 1938, Disney personally welcomed the NAZI film director Lenny Reifenstahl to his studios. In the biography, Walt Disney Triumph of the American Imagination, author Neil Gabler said Walt was tolerant in his home life, but it's not known if the same spirit of tolerance extended to the studio. Of all the Jewish people who worked at Walt's studio, it would be hard to find one who thought, who thought that Walt was anti-SEMITIC. Gabler said the charges stem less from Disney's personal beliefs and more that he aligned himself with groups that had those beliefs, like the Motion Picture Alliance, which he did after the 1941 animator strike at his studio. The MPA, as it was known, discouraged the hiring of minorities, which is probably why he didn't hire them at Disneyland. If he wasn't personally biased against minorities, he knowingly aligned himself with those who were for the benefit of his business. Walt Disney, an extreme control freak, almost anyone who knew Disney in a personal or professional capacity claimed that he had a difficult time giving up control of any of his film projects. Some would say it was because he was hyper-focused and knew that only he could make the film the best it could possibly be. Walt Disney took credit for everything. Although Disney won more Academy Awards and received more nominations than any individual in history, he wasn't always eager to acknowledge the efforts of the many animators who put in all the hard work creating the films. In fact, Disney never acknowledged their contributions at all, or anyone who put any work into his films when accepting his awards. Many of those with whom Disney worked commented that he gave his staff little encouragement due to his exceptionally high expectations. One day in 1952, while Peter Pan was still in production, the Disney Board of Directors was discussing future film projects, and Bobby's name came up. Walt Disney was empathetic. He didn't want Bobby appearing in juvenile roles any longer because his voice had changed and he had a severe case of acne. Walt said that Bobby looked more like a kid that you would expect to see bagging groceries at the AMP than someone who would be starring in movies. Though no fault of his own, Bobby Driscoll was out of a job. The boss had fired him. The board of directors decided that the information would be kept confidential until Peter Pan was released and its publicity campaign was over. They didn't want a sympathy story or a critical press inquiry costing them money at the box office the only person who was directly affected by the firing and didn't know about it was 15 year old bobby driscoll the secret would be kept for almost a year that was when the 16 year old bobby driscoll lost it peter pan was number one at the box office it will go on to be the second highest grossing movie of the decade and every review gave bobby a great deal of the credit 
and then they fired him. Bobby didn't understand. He couldn't understand that this is when he broke down. And yes, he did cry. Bobby wasn't a star at that point. He was just a kid in trouble. He desperately needed to speak to someone, anyone, so they could explain it to him. In the span of less than five minutes, one boy's life and world collapsed. Bobby fell apart and he desperately needed someone to notice and to care. He needed someone to tell him that he still counted. He needed someone to tell him that it hadn't all been about money or maybe just a hug from his uncle Walt. He didn't get any of those things. Instead, the secretary called security and had Bobby escorted off the property. Some of the executives would later say how much his firing bothered them because they all liked Bobby. They all thought he was a terrific kid and that he had grown into an intelligent, hardworking, sensitive young man. These executives knew that Bobby was going to get hurt and they felt bad about it. But Walt was the boss. What he said was law at Disney. They were right. Bobby did get hurt, but it was even worse than anything anyone could have anticipated. It was bad as it could get. And this wasn't just about being fired. Bobby felt betrayed by someone he thought loved him. Someone who had actually said those very words to him, but obviously never meant it. That is how unemployment goes from being a statistic into the realm of a Shakespearean tragedy. There are a lot of people who worked for Disney in 1953 who would always feel responsible for what happened to Bobby. Not only on that one day, but for the rest of his short life because it shouldn't have happened there is no excuse for it that is the sin that is where the fault lies every bad thing that followed grew from this one seed and it wouldn't end up costing bobby his life it wouldn't have happened right away there would be years of misery and unhappiness and loneliness first someone should have taken bobby aside and talked to him any decent person would have done that much. Looking back, all the decent people must have been taking the day off that day in 1953. Someone should have helped him assess where it was and where he was headed. They knew that his career was over and his greatest successes were probably behind him, but they chose to keep his information a secret. They could have given him some career counseling, maybe helped steer him into a new career in directing or producing. Bobby was a very bright kid. He had an IQ over 140. He could learn anything if anyone had taken the time to teach him. That is what you do when you are dealing with a kid who needs direction. They could have helped him plan for his future because they already seen the same thing before. They had had over a year to figure this all out, but chose to do nothing. Bobby was the only one who was going to pay for their mistake, and it was their mistake because they had a moral obligation, even if they didn't have a legal obligation. They had millions of dollars from the Song of the South, So Dear to My Heart, Treasure Island, and Peter Pan, but that was an end onto itself, except to Bobby, who had always given them everything they had ever asked from him. In return, they had destroyed his heart and raped his soul. Between not doing what should have been done and doing something which they should have never been done, they had a lot about which to feel guilty. But at least it bothered their conscience, at least they had. Despite his success, Bobby could never seem to please his parents. They physically abused him and kept him locked in a closet for hours at a time, sometimes all night. When Bobby was around nine, the beatings became so bad, Disney temporarily moved him in with the family of his co-star, Lunana Patton. They could not shoot after all if their star was battered and bruised. When shooting wrapped, he went back home. Child abuse was still extremely normalized during this time and was also an accepted method of getting a good performance out of a child. Many of Bobby's contemporaries describe being slapped in the face or being manhandled by adults as everyday occurrences on set. Around this time, Walt Disney himself became fixated on Driscoll. Mark Elliott stating Walt often referred to Bobby as the living embodiment of his own youth. He saw the child as an extension of himself and ignored Bobby's own identity. 
Bobby was susceptible to the attention and latched onto Walt as a father figure. He came to see Disney Studios as a family, and indeed, Uncle Walt encouraged this idea, especially among his child performers. One performer animator described feeling uncomfortable by seeing higher-ups kiss Bobby on the face and mouth. Let me read that again. One former animator described feeling uncomfortable by seeing higher-ups kiss Bobby on the face and mouth. During Bobby's preteen years, he was signed to a new seven-year contract and given a substantial raise of $750 per week. Bizarrely, Bobby was now making the most money he ever would, while actually working less than ever before. He was cast the leading role of Peter Pan as both the voice and visual inspiration for the character. Peter had Bobby's wide eyes and upturned nose. If you watch any Bobby Driscoll movie and then watch Peter Pan in motion, you can easily see the character's every facial expression and mannerism taken directly from Driscoll. His expressions, eyebrow, nose scrunching, even down to the way he positions his wrist. But as Bobby got older, Walt stopped speaking affectionately of him in meetings. He stated Bobby was no longer likable enough to play the protagonist. Meanwhile, Peter Pan was released and is a massive hit. In 1953, Bobby became to hear rumors he would be fired. He tried asking the higher-ups he was formerly friendly with, but none would speak to him. He went to Walt's secretary asking to speak to Mr. Disney. She refused to call him, and Bobby asked again. She abruptly told him he was no longer needed and to get out. Stunned, Bobby burst into tears. She called security and had the boy escorted off of Disney property. Disney Studios told the press they had let Bobby go due to extreme chaos of acne which sullied his image and other movie studios personally i don't buy the acne explanation acne can be covered and disney was focusing heavily on television at the time which had a terrible picture quality compared to film not to mention walt had already talked about shifting bobby into playing unlikable bully characters but the true reason for the cancellation of bobby's seven-year contract we may never know Unable to find work, Bobby's parents enrolled him in public school. He was mercilessly bullied for his Disney roles, being beaten up by his classmates constantly. He stated he became afraid all the time, and it was at this time he began experimenting with drugs. After being in prison for possession of marijuana, he was eventually sentenced to a rehab center. They so-called first of its kind employed no doctors or nurses and used abusive psychiatric practices now outlawed. During this time, Disney was making millions off of the heavenly merchandising of Peter Pan. Bobby never saw a dime from this, despite his likeliness being used. Bobby's life remained difficult, and although he had a few more acting roles and became talented in artist of the beatnik scene, he just couldn't make enough money to get by. He died on March 30th, 1968 at age 31, without a penny to his name, alone and forgotten. He was found on a dirty cot in an abandoned building. His body was unidentified and the police could not find anyone to recognize him. He was buried in a mass grave unmarked on Hart Island. Eventually, his mother asked Disney to help find him, and he was finally identified through fingerprints, although his remains were not moved to a cemetery, which would have been possible at the time. Now, with all of that being said, I know that was a lot of information about the young Bobby Driscoll, but there's more information that states that he may have been sexually abused. And let's get right into that, and then I will give my final synopsis on this whole situation. There's a lot of bizarre lore surrounding the legend of Walt Disney. Just off the top of our heads, we've heard he's a communist, despite him being a founding member of the Anti-Communist Motion Picture Alliance for Preservation of American Ideals, a Nazi, a fascist, a racist, a homosexual, a chronologically frozen head, and now thanks to the new book by Dawn Reporter, Hollywood Babylon Strikes Again, we can add pedophiles to the list. Reports Gay Sex Blog Net, the book alleges that Disney was fond of trying on his mother's makeup and clothes and high heels as a child and that he could uh, never get an erection for women. Hollywood Babylon Strikes Again further alleges that Disney owned a Los Angeles apartment in order to meet up with various rent boys, including a man named Ralph Ferguson, who has gone on record stating that he received $100 for sex with Disney. 
and there is a real eyebrow razor. Author Porter also writes that Disney fell in love with young star Bobby Driscoll of the Song of the South movie made in 1946, who also voiced Peter Pan, which might be another reason Walt Disney Company wants you to forget about the Song of the South and that the movie ever existed. Anyway, Gay Sex Blognet further states, Driscoll says he was dropped like garbage when I was no longer a cute little kid and I didn't appeal to Walt anymore. Ew. Either way, keeping in mind the perpetual smoke and mirrors surrounding Disney, take it all with a grain of salt. The same book, according to Amazon.review, also alleges Charlton Heston was a bisexual lover of young Marlon Brando, had sex with his son Christian and daughter Cheyenne. This was the perfect opportunity for Walt to come in and take little Bobby Driscoll, which is exactly what he did. Bobby looked up to him as a father figure. When you look up to people in a certain way, especially as an adolescent with a lot of innocence, you kind of let them do whatever to you. You don't know what's wrong until you know what's wrong. So allegedly, Walt Disney fell in love with Bobby. He was obsessed with him. And there is a lot of rumors around that time that Walt Disney himself allegedly was sexually abusing Bobby Driscoll. Once Bobby got to a certain age, which when he got older and started looking more mature, that's when Disney wanted nothing to do with him. I do not believe that Bobby was fired due to him getting acne and him getting older when he had a number one movie in the box office at the time of him being fired. So his looks obviously didn't matter. Like people loved his look. They, you know, they could care less. People were very shocked. Bobby was a heartthrob in Hollywood. Young ladies was obsessed with him. So it just didn't make sense for you to take one of your number one stars and fire them without any reason. I believe Bobby was fired because he, like Walt said, he is older looking. He has acne and he was no longer appealing to Walt. Walt always was affectionate towards Bobby. Walt was one of the alleged up high, you know, higher ups that was kissing Bobby in the mouth and on his face. And when Bobby was staying um, with this family member or I'm sorry, family member, the actor, Alana, that he was staying with, he did not stay there. It's rumored that he was actually living with Walt Disney and they used him visiting Lana's family as the excuse to say this is where he's living. He actually wasn't. He was living with Walt Disney on Walt Disney's land. And Walt Disney was basically allegedly having his way with little Bobby Driscoll. And Bobby was really hurt. You know, when he got fired because he didn't only look at Walt as an uncle or a father. He also looked at him as a boyfriend and he felt betrayed. He did not understand all of these false promises that Walt had promised him and stated that, you know, you're going to be a big star. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And remember, it was hidden from Bobby for almost a year that he was being fired from Disney. Not only that, Disney pretty much abolished him. They got rid of everything with him except for Peter Pan, the Song of the South. And at the Disneyland theme parks, out of all of the legendary movies, they had their own ride. Bobby never got a ride or anything like that. It's pretty much like they just got rid of him. It's like he never existed. And I feel that they did that due to what Bobby was going around saying about Walt Disney, about Walt allegedly having sexual you know getting sexual favors from him and also you know just using him as a you know sexual rag doll if you will you know just kind of had his way with him and when he was done he would send him off back to Lana's family they would take care of him and then when Walt wanted him again sexually allegedly he would have him come back and Walt once again would have his way with him so with Bobby falling ill to drugs and all of that. I don't believe that that is true. I believe that Bobby was doing drugs at a very young age from the age of nine and up. If you ask me, in my opinion, that Bobby had been doing drugs and I believe that the handlers were giving him the drugs so that he didn't necessarily know what was going on when he was being sexual with Walt Disney. So was Walt Disney a predator? In my opinion, absolutely. I believe that Walt Disney had sexual affairs and sexual encounters with Bobby Driscoll. And I believe that that's why Bobby Driscoll just fell off and why his world was just literally collapsed and he just felt like destroyed on the inside. It's because of all of the false promises that somebody he loved that told him that they loved him lied 
about and he didn't know how to handle it. Remember, he was a child. You know, he was a kid. He didn't know how to deal with this type of energy. And Walt Disney ought to be ashamed of himself. And Bobby Driscoll is not the only boy that was used by Walt. We will get into them as well. Tell me, tell